the ride home is always really tough, going home empty-handed, emotionally and physically. Is it hard to keep hope? As far as the hope of actually finding her, that dwindles, you know, every day. But then in October of 2015, nearly two years after Kelsey's disappearance, there's a shocking development. A mysterious message giving Laura hope comes through the Help Find Kelsey Facebook page. That's the page that Laura had set up to gather tips and leads on the case. It was saying, if I have information about Kelsey, can I re remain anonymous? When Laura responds, a man emails her saying, ma'am, please, your daughter is not dead. She will be back home alive. The man offers a harrowing account of what really happened to Kelsey. He claims that Dante hired a friend to kill her and says, Dante has no idea she is alive. He thinks she is dead. And that the friend did not kill her. He sold her into sex trafficking. It made me sick. I mean, I, I could barely function. What if she is still out there somewhere? The emailer says he needs money to help Kelsey escape. $50,000 in cash. So the plan is this. The money is to be brought to Vancouver, Washington, specifically to a local McDonald's restaurant. Then it's to be hand delivered to a guy named Marcus who would be wearing a red hat. Once the money was exchanged, then this courier person would go and get Kelsey and bring her back to the McDonald's. I will have to sell some stocks, which will take about a week, but I can push to expedite that process. I just thought, what if she's been out there and, and I could have found her and, and we haven't? I mean, it was just, what if, what if? Laura sets up the meeting at the McDonald's in Vancouver to deliver the cash. But even though she's desperate for answers, she's worried that something criminal is going on. So she reaches out to the Vancouver police and asks them to go undercover to meet this courier. It felt like law enforcement from Vancouver should have been involved in the situation. But just before the appointed time, the Vancouver police back out, believing it to be an internet scam and not an actual human trafficking plot. But 2020 had the McDonald's under surveillance to see if anyone would show up. Our cameras are rolling as a man with a red hat comes in. That's him. He sits quietly. But after no one shows up, he takes off. Okay, he's on move. Cut the engine. Weird, eerie to see that they actually were, you know, going through with this. He's gone. It was just all a matter of trying to get down to the truth of this. As I was investigating this mysterious email, a contact of mine told me about another missing woman's case that proved to be the key to unraveling this mystery. In Portsmouth, Ohio, 1,200 miles away from Colorado, Megan Lancaster, 25 years old, has also suddenly disappeared. Katie Lancaster is on a mission to help find her sister-in-law. I mean, she's gone without a trace. We have her car and her wallet. An eerie feeling like there's something, like we're going to find something. Months go by with no developments. Megan's family organizes searches and sets up a Facebook page to publicize the case. And then out of nowhere, he pops up. A startling message comes through the family's Facebook page about Megan. He says, I know where Megan is, and I can get her back. Just like with Kelsey's family, the emailer says he can help Megan escape, but he needs money, $50,000. He directs them to bring $25,000 in cash up front to Vancouver, Washington, specifically to that same McDonald's, and deliver it to a man named Marcus, wearing, no surprise, a red hat. What if he really does have her, and I can bring her home? You should stick with the crew, behind the camera, with the crew. To unravel just what's going on with this mystery, Katie agreed to work with 2020 to set up a sting operation. Katie and I are gonna be in one vehicle. Just like Laura did two weeks earlier, she arranges a meeting to drop off the money in Vancouver at that McDonald's. There are booths over here. Katie, you said this morning that they sent you a text message they will be sending Marcus. Okay, they're both rolling now. I would be going to this rendezvous with Katie, but wearing a hidden camera. 
As we walk into the McDonald's at the appointed meet time, we quickly spot Marcus, the man in the red hat, and walk over to him. Katie was instructed not to ask any questions, so I told Marcus, hey, the money is in the trunk of a car parked outside. Right when they're at the trunk, get ready, we're about 10 seconds away. Meanwhile, I was waiting outside with our camera team and a security guard in case this thing went sideways. Okay, let's get ready. As they head out to the parking lot, before the trunk is opened, I walk over to Marcus. I want to get some answers. Marcus Ryan Smith, ABC News. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. Why'd you come here to take $25,000 from Katie? Uh, I don't know. You don't know why you're here to take $25,000 from Katie? Nope. What are you here for? Oh, because to collect some money. You see, Marcus claims he was suckered too, lured online into a supposed jewelry venture. He says he was supposed to pick up the money and then wire it to someone he's never met. So a random guy tells you to go to a McDonald's twice in less than two weeks to meet people to pick up money, and you don't think anything of it? I didn't think none of it. We were told that you were going to deliver Megan to Katie today. Is that true? I have no idea about no Megan or no kidnapping or anything like that. This would be a scheme to extort money from families who have family members that are missing. I didn't know nothing of this. I had no clue anybody was supposed to be exchanging nothing for a human being. If I did know, I would not have been involved in this situation. So you've been here twice, coming to pick up money at a McDonald's. Your name is attached to this. I just feel shaky inside. I had no clue. It's important that you be real honest yeah, with Yeah, me. I'm real honest. You have never heard of Kelsey Shelley? Never. Definitely uh, a big scam. I want to know who's behind it. But an FBI analysis of the emailer's Facebook page showed it used an IP address traced all the way to Russia. In most scams, they're compartmentalized. So the person you may send to pick up the cash at a particular location may know nothing about what the scam is. Then that's just 100% clarification that, you know, this is, this is some dirtbags out there, you know, trying to get money off of these poor families. But while the extortion plot that was torturing Laura was laid to rest, the roller coaster ride wasn't over. A sympathetic stranger who feels for Laura comes up with a shocking plan to go undercover on her own and befriend Dante to try to find the truth about what happened to Kelsey. I knew that I was potentially putting myself into danger. Dante Lucas. And when we go to get some answers from Dante, she was right there with him. What do you have to say to her family? Even though Laura Saxton lives hundreds of miles away from Pueblo, Colorado, the news about her years-long crusade to find her missing daughter continued to resonate with folks living there. Our top story tonight, the search for Kelsey Schelling. Today, law enforcement following new leads in the case. We're going to keep coming up with ideas. I mean, we're, we're trying everything. I felt really heartbroken for her. As a mom, I couldn't even begin to fathom knowing that your child's out there. It's spring of 2016 when Lauren Shore, a single mom living near Pueblo, says Laura's story inspired her to hatch an audacious plan of her own. Make Facebook friends with Dante Lucas, gain his trust, and meet up with him in real life, and just maybe help solve the mystery of what happened to Kelsey. Definitely was nerve-wracking, but I felt like I could do it. So I had messaged him on Facebook, and I told him that I was looking to meet new friends. He responded fairly quickly, within, I say, a couple of hours. Lauren was eventually able to get Dante to meet her in person. When we shot this footage of Dante playing basketball in 2016, Lauren was there with him. She says it was only the second time they'd ever met. We had went to a basketball court to just play around, shoot some hoops, and that's when a man with a camera came up to us. Dante Lucas, I'm with ABC News 2020. The family of Kelsey says you're responsible for her disappearance. Is that true? Who's Kelsey? I freaked out. I had to play the role that I didn't know what was happening. So I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Like, what is happening? What the f is happening? 
And he kind of just shut down and was like, I'll tell you about it later on. Don't freak out. It's okay. None of this is true. As the weeks go by, Lauren says she's able to develop a close relationship with Dante. We just hang around the family, watch movies, drink a little bit. He always smelt of alcohol. He comes off as very cocky, I feel like. He feels like he's just the man, and he's just, he can't do no wrong. Just as she'd planned, Lauren says she got Dante to open up, to trust her enough. The time finally seemed right to ask him about Kelsey. There was only a certain amount of period of time that he would talk about it. One minute, he had no involvement. He had nothing to do with it. And then he would just shut down and start crying hysterically and get really upset. But Lauren says something very unexpected mm -hmm. happened with Dante. Her undercover relationship with him blossomed into romance. I felt like he did genuinely develop feelings for me and did genuinely fall in love with me. He has this way about him that makes you just feel so sorry for him. In the back of my mind, I always kept that he is potentially a murderer. Lauren says her relationship with Dante continued for about a year. But then something happened. There was an incident outside his house that made her realize she was in way over her head. He's like, I want you to marry me. And he showed me the ring. I took the ring. At that point, I was kind of like done because I didn't want to get in any deeper than I had already gotten into. Despite all the efforts of this clandestine girlfriend, her work doesn't seem to be paying off, and the clock just keeps ticking for Laura Saxton. She's not any closer to knowing the truth about what happened to Kelsey. I wasn't happy at all with how things were going, and I mean, that's one big reason why I wanted to do the first story with you guys was I was hoping that that would somehow bring something out into the light. Tonight on 2020, when do you stop looking for a pregnant daughter who's vanished? In May of 2016, our first 2020 program on the Kelsey Schelling case hits the airwaves. The very day of our broadcast, there's a big announcement regarding the investigation into Kelsey's disappearance. The Colorado Bureau of Investigation was going to join the case. That was news to me, so I was kind of like, oh my God, this is awesome. I think once that 2020 special aired, it really turned up the heat on Pueblo police and on this case. Taking over the case, Pueblo Police Department Commander Eric Bravo and CBI agent Kevin Torres. Working together, they moved fast, turning it from a missing persons case into a full-blown criminal investigation. It was a homicide investigation in our eyes, so I immediately started working on setting a plan into motion how we wanted to proceed. Police got a tip that led them to believe Schelling's body might be in Dante's backyard. It's not long before police dig up the yard of the house where Dante and his family had been staying. So we thought, man, you know, we really have something. Uh, but it went from elation to, to satisfaction. You know, that day it just seemed like we were there and, and then it slipped away. During the investigation, Agent Torres finds out about Dante's relationship with Lauren Shore. When he interviews Shore, she reveals that Dante had made a key admission to her about Kelsey's disappearance. And it's about that Walmart surveillance video of the mystery man walking over to her car and then driving off with it. She confirmed for us, Dante admitting it was him in the Walmart surveillance video. She also informed us that Dante admitted to her dropping Kelsey's car off at St. Mary Corwin Hospital. The piece of information that Lauren provided to us was a pretty crucial piece at that point. Then, in late 2017, there's a huge development that will totally transform the case. A Pueblo man tells police that Dante and other family members had attacked him in front of their home and stolen a thousand bucks from him. Now that gives police a reason to arrest Dante. I had information that Dante was leaving Pueblo and was heading to DIA where he seemingly intended to board a flight to Tucson. And the concern was that he may take other efforts to meet friends in Mexico. Boy, the anxiety level was high, the tension was high. The time was ticking away, and the tires were turning on the road. And Dante was within 20 minutes of getting on a plane for Tucson, Arizona, when he was arrested. When he was arrested, there was hope across the community that maybe investigators would finally get some answers in this case. 
we decided that the next day would be the day that uh, we would send a couple detectives back in to try and uh, answer some of the questions that we didn't have answered. During his interrogation, Dante finally breaks down and comes clean, confirming Lauren Shore's account that he was the one seen in that Walmart video. So that information that he confirmed that that was him was huge. You see, it was that admission, combined with the wealth of evidence from text messages, cell phone records, and surveillance video already gathered, all of that was enough for prosecutors to move forward. At the end of the day, I said, I think we have enough here to go forward. I ethically believe that Dante Lucas killed Kelsey Schilling, and I think we have the evidence to prove it. A major development, the ex-boyfriend of a pregnant Denver woman who went missing four years ago. He now faces charges of first-degree murder. How are you thinking as his trial approached? Are you thinking justice will be done? I put a lot of things on hold because I just was, you know, sure it was going to happen and, you know, wanted to be ready to go. So after eight years, Dante Lucas is finally in court and the prosecution has a surprise witness. That just took the whole room's breath away. No one saw that coming. This story became such a big deal here in Pueblo because people want answers and they haven't gotten any for eight years. Dante Lucas, the Pueblo man accused of murdering his pregnant ex-girlfriend Kelsey Schelling nearly eight years ago, is headed to trial tomorrow. Did I think it was going to be a tough case? Absolutely. And we well may not win it. But I owe it to the family. I think I owe it to Kelsey to go forward and try this case. Cardio News Channel 13's Dan Beatty has been following this case and the trial for more than two years. I was anticipating there to just be a mad rush of reporting.
going to try to get into the courtroom. I was very worried that I might not even get a seat. You could feel the anticipation. When I saw Laura Saxton walk into the judicial building, you could tell this was a day she's been waiting for for a long time. Denver 7's Liz Gillardi in Pueblo today for opening statements. Liz, you have been with this case every step of the way now for all these years. The prosecution simply started out and they said, this is not a missing persons case, this is a homicide case. The case that the prosecution was making right off the jump was, one, they were going to prove through text messages and surveillance video that Dante Lucas has to be the one responsible for Kelsey Schelling's death. These were two people in a relationship. Kelsey Schelling became pregnant. Dante Lucas didn't want to have a baby. And he made sure that didn't happen. I know that she had mentioned Kelsey Schelling's Chevy Cruze. The prosecution said this car tells a story and they told the jurors that you will see Dante Lucas moving this car around Pueblo in the days after she went missing. The idea that someone can essentially disappear without a trace, I think is kind of a counterintuitive thought for people to have. Prosecutors think there's enough evidence to convict Lucas even without a body, but the defense disagrees. In the opening statements, the defense said this is a missing persons case. This has always been a missing persons case. They said there's no body, there's no evidence. Why should you believe that Dante Lucas killed her? They do not have a crime scene. They do not have a murder weapon. Today, the jury got a detailed look at some of the text messages exchanged between them. For the prosecutors, their goal was to show that those text messages showed intent, showed that Dante Lucas consistently lied, not only to investigators, but to Laura Saxton herself. What they refer to as his luring of, of Kelsey Schelling to Pueblo. The prosecution say that he lured her there to end her life. We know that that's his phone. He admitted to those text messages. We know that that's his thoughts and feelings about it. That's direct evidence. And the movements of their phones as well, as they were pinging off cell phone towers in Pueblo on the night of February 4th and the early morning hours of February 5th. I think that a lot of the case really centered around those movements. Two pivotal witnesses testified to the high-profile Pueblo murder case against Dante Lucas. First witness was Laura Saxton, and we were not expecting Laura Saxton to be the first one to take the stand. She didn't break down, but you can tell she's hurting. There's a lot of pain behind her voice. I think that was really powerful uh, for the jury to see. Her mom spoke to the fact that she absolutely wanted this baby. Prosecutors today painted Kelsey Schelling as an excited mother-to-be, desperate to make it work with her boyfriend. It didn't take long for the prosecutors to swing for the fences, calling some pretty shocking witnesses to the stand. Ryan Rivera is a former Pueblo County inmate who considered himself to be a friend of Dante Lewis. And when he took the stand, he said, that Dante Lucas told him that they're never going to find Kelsey Schelling's body. That just took the whole room's breath away. Ryan Rivera, he was the only person who came forward over the duration of this trial that really said, Dante told me he did this. I wasn't in the courtroom, but while jailhouse snitch on its face is just not credible. I mean, that's the assumption that we believe jurors have, and it's the assumption we have as defense lawyers. Why would this person do it? What's the benefit? What's the motive? There was no deals made about charges he would get to plead to, time he would get to serve. There was no deals like that. There were a lot of names on the prosecutor's list that I was shocked by. But Sarah Lucas certainly topped that list. When you saw that Sarah Lucas was on the prosecution side, everyone wondered, what is she gonna say? The one important thing that I've kind of mentioned, she confirmed that Dante was the last person left alone with Kelsey. The prosecution painted a picture of a troubled relationship. Some of Kelsey's close friends testified they pointed toward elements of domestic abuse in Kelsey and Dante's relationship. Something worth pointing out 
was the prosecution and even the defense made it clear that Dante was using Kelsey for a number of things. For her money, Dante used Kelsey for her apartment in Denver, and Dante used Kelsey for her car. And his argument was, she lets me do it. The defense pushed the narrative that Kelsey Schelling popped pills, was an addict, that Kelsey, when she left Dante Lucas at the Southside Walmart here in Pueblo, that she was going to meet up with a drug dealer. There's no single person other than the defendant in 2017 who's saying that she was into drugs and that she was a party girl. You didn't have the forensic evidence. It seemed like you were really relying on circumstantial evidence and the evidence of snitches and these other witnesses. That's pretty straightforward. Either you believe them or you don't. The witness list yields more surprises. The ones who make it to court. I know that my testimony could potentially help take him down. And the ones who didn't. Witness 31-year-old Roxanne Martinez was found shot to death. That was a completely unforeseen development in this case. Breaking on Denver 7, a key witness in the Kelsey Schelling murder trial found dead. That witness, 31-year-old Roxanne Martinez, was found shot to death in Denver last week. Well, these are still very stunning developments. Roxanne Martinez, a witness for the prosecution, was set to testify soon. That was just an absolutely, completely unforeseen uh, development in this case. People were reeling when that news broke. Denver police officers were called to a residential area in Southeast Denver on a report of an unresponsive female who was lying in the roadway. We determined that that individual had been shot one time and died from that injury. Her dad is in shock, her mom, her stepmom. It, it's just you know, tragic all the way around. I think when a witness in any major case turns up dead directly before they're set to testify, I think of course people are going to think, was she killed because she was going to testify? Denver police arrested a suspect in Martinez's killing, 29-year-old Emmanuel Chandler. Chandler has been charged with first-degree murder, but he hasn't entered a plea yet. We don't have any connection between Mr. Chandler and Mr. Lucas or anybody associated with that trial. Our concern was to make sure that people understood that while she was an endorsed witness, uh, I couldn't comment on her testimony. Nobody knows what Roxanne Martinez was going to say on the stand for sure, with the exception of maybe the investigators who talked to her. But while prosecutors say they can't discuss what Roxanne Martinez would have said on the stand, 2020 has uncovered some revealing details about her. You see, back in March of 2016, a woman named Roxanne had reached out to Laura Saxton through that Help Find Kelsey Facebook page. Roxanne messaged that she used to date the guy Kelsey was pregnant with, and he told me what had happened and started crying. I'm instantly like mixed emotions, like, okay, are you going for the reward or, you know, are, are you for real? When Laura asked, do you know where Kelsey is located? Roxanne replied, he told me everything. Yes, I do. Basically, her information sounded very good and very promising, and so we really wanted to meet with her. This mysterious woman agreed to meet Laura and her husband at a Mexican restaurant in Denver. We were actually on our way there, and I tried to reach her by phone to let her know we were coming. She said that she was in the hospital and couldn't meet us. That was kind of the extent of what I really remember. And then, you know, past that, then, you know, that was all turned over to law enforcement to look into further. Authorities say that woman was the same Roxanne who was killed during the trial. I can confirm that CBI followed up and interviewed her, that we did have her as an endorsed witness that we wanted to testify during trial. The thing that I'm steering clear from is I don't, um, I just don't want to talk about evidence that wasn't actually admitted during trial. Martinez's killing shakes up the trial and threatens to overshadow the testimony of another prosecution witness who had a remarkable story to tell. It's none other than Lauren Shore, that woman who befriended Dante as part of a plan to try to find out what happened to Kelsey. I know that my testimony could potentially help take him down, and that was realistically why I wanted to testify. 
Shore testifies about Dante's critical admission to her that he was the mysterious figure seen picking up Kelsey's car after it sat overnight in a Walmart parking lot. I said, so that must have meant that you had dropped the car off at the hospital, correct? And that's when he said, yes, that he, that was him that dropped the car off. When the defense cross-examines Shore, they attack her credibility and her motives. At one point, characterizing her as a sex informant because she had a physical relationship with Dante. It's fair game, and if you're going to put yourself out there like she did and sleep with someone, the jury ought to know about that. You're having intimate conversations, and that cast a lot of suspicion on her as a witness. The sex informant part really bothered me because I wasn't having sex with Dante to get answers out of him. I was playing my part and role as girlfriend. So to me, to be called such was really really degrading. On the very last day of its case, the prosecution played an interrogation video of Dante confirming Shore's account. The clip that I played at the beginning of my closing was his phrase to detectives, I lied from the jump. I moved the car. I wanted the jury to hear the defendant in his own words say I lied. When it's the defense's turn to present its case, they raise a lot of eyebrows in court. The defense didn't call a single witness to the stand. The defense immediately rested their case. And it was just another moment where your jaw hit the floor. The burden of proof is on the government. It's simply messaging in a very strong way to the jury. They haven't done it. It's not guilty. So it's a strong message. There was just really not a lot of hard forensic evidence to go off of. So as far as, you know, what evidence they, they put forth the court that was irrefutable, that, that Dante Lucas killed Kelsey Schelling, I never saw that. After a shocking final day of the trial, the jury was going to deliberate, and I had no idea what was going to happen at that point. I think everybody was just, like, <laughs> holding their breath. Prosecution and defense have given closing arguments. The jury is now deliberating. Well, on that last day of the trial, no one expected to get a verdict that day. So now the waiting begins. Yes. And I was prepared to camp out at the courthouse as long as I had to. I really thought I would be there all week. Men were really totally unprepared for when they came and told us the verdict was in. I think we, were, we all were just like, Oh my God. I mean, it was shocking how quickly they arrived at their decision, especially given just the amount of information they had to look at. Uh, I can tell you because the decision came back so early, all of our experience as prosecutors is that this was probably an acquittal because juries tend to come to decisions more quickly on acquittals than convictions. It was like standing on the precipice of a cliff and looking down, it, it, it was scary. It was a very tense atmosphere in the courthouse while everyone was waiting to hear what the verdict was. Even I was nervous, and I'm not affiliated with Kelsey Schelling's family at all. People were wondering, does that mean Dante Lucas is going to walk? I think everybody was just like holding their breath almost. And then when you hear the verdict, tell me how you're feeling. Well, the words came out way too slow. Like, I feel like the judge was talking in slow-mo, even though he wasn't. I mean, I was just like, every word, it's like, okay, okay, spit it out, please. Um, and then he finally got to, you know, guilty of first degree. And uh, I think that was the first breath, like, I had taken in a long time. This is a guilty verdict, eight years in the making, and even though Kelsey Schelling's body has never been found, the jury clearly felt there was prison without parole. It, it was just so emotional for, for everybody, for both sides. It's a sad story. It's a sad situation that didn't have to end up like this if he had just let her come home. 
You mentioned it was a lot of emotions for both sides. Did you find yourself looking over at their side? Dante was sitting right in front of me. I looked at the back of his head through the whole trial. Um, but, you know, the mother of his child was there and she broke down and honestly, my, my heart hurt for her, hurt for their child because it, it didn't have to, it didn't have to end up this way. Ryan Rivera's testimony was the biggest like bombshell for our, our trial. It had moved us all. I could hear the gasps even in the masks of, of fellow jurors. When it came out that he was convicted, I think there was a great feeling of, of satisfaction. Not elation. You know, you have to look at it from this side too. Mr. Lucas is a young man and he was convicted of a criminal crime that shapes his life for however long he lives. I think it's every parent's worst nightmare that a child goes before you and you can never fully heal that wound. I can tell you uh, I almost lost a child in the early 80s and so I had a lot of sympathy with Laura and her family because I came that close to that tragedy. And that child was the lead prosecutor on this case. So the elected DA is my dad, and Kyle McCarthy, who was obviously on the case with me, is my husband. And we, I don't think, had a night in the last four years that we haven't gone home and talked about Kelsey Schelling. Um, sometimes it's the first thing we talk about when we wake up. Sometimes it's the last thing we talk about before we go to sleep. On Saturdays when we're driving kids around you know, the soccer, yeah. a lot of times we're being told to stop talking about it because they can hear us in the front seat talking about it. We both also had, and I mean, I, an incredible emotional pull to the family. That is a very special relationship, one that I will value for the rest of my life. Well, I think, I mean, Michelle and Kyle with their, their closing, they're, they're just, they're amazing. I, I don't even know what other words to use. The first things that she told the reporters outside of the courthouse after the guilty verdict, yes, she was happy, but she was still devastated. So we're very, very thankful for, for this outcome. Um, but in the end, I didn't get Kelsey back. And that's what I wanted more than anything. <laughs> So I feel like I didn't do something. I didn't push hard enough on something or I didn't look enough on something to, to bring her home. That devastation isn't going anywhere. Like she said, she has to live with that forever. Her goal throughout all of this was to bring Kelsey home, give her a, a proper burial. So I know when she had expressed that in some ways she felt like she had failed in her, her main mission. I think the investigative team has uh, some ideas where she may rest. If, if that's where she is, I, that, that's just like the worst possibility to me. That very first day that we met in September of 2016, I'll never forget it like it was yesterday and it was just a special bond that we formed. Kelsey's mom just battled and battled and battled. Eight years, I was hoping that it would never take this long. I grabbed my mother very tight and held her very close, hold on to my dad's hands. Since the trial's over, it's because, and, and Kelsey still hasn't been found, so but yeah, I've just felt very empty this past week doesn't feel final because still don't know where Kelsey is and we still don't know exactly what happened. It turns out that prosecutors did present troubling evidence from the night Kelsey disappeared. That evidence provided a possible explanation to where her body could be. We received information from the Pueblo landfill that there was some video evidence of a, of a vehicle being there. You couldn't see what kind of vehicle. You couldn't tell who was in the car. Uh, their lock to their front um, uh, gate into the dump had been tampered with. 
Well, it caught my attention when I grabbed the lock on my hand, and I said, well, somebody tried to get in here overnight. The cell phone records, the pings were all out in that area. So, you know, we suspected that's, that's what happened. If you heard the testimony of the landfill expert, it would be next to impossible to just find a body just by conducting a, a search of the landfill. Who wants that for their child to be the final resting place? No one. We want to bring her justice and bring her home with us, um, her and Kadri both. Kadri, that was the name that she was going to give the child. I'm never going to recover with, without getting her back. And so I still have nowhere to go to take her flowers, to go sit and talk with her, take her balloons on her birthday, I, you know, go to see her on the holidays. Hi, Dad. Hi, Coco Bean. You want her to be remembered. A little girl <laughs> with a really big heart, a really big smile, a really big laugh, beautiful eyes, silly. She was so silly. I miss being silly with her. I miss all the things that we didn't get to do together. Ultimate!